انا رح احكي بالعربي بس بعض المتكلمين رح يحكوا بالانجليزي اهلا وسهلا فيكم لكلية لهوت المعمدانية العربية ولهالمناسبة الحلوة هاي موضوعنا اليوم هو موضوع شيق جدا قراءة سياسية لسفر الرؤية انشاء ثقافة النقد والمقاومة <تصفيق> شو بنعرف عن سفر الرؤية؟ نحن نحن عم نجرب ندرس سفر الرؤية سفر الرؤية سفر صعب جدا صعب الفهم ليش؟ لأنه كتاب مليء بالرموز ومليء بالألغاز كتاب يعنى بالأيام الأخيرة هيك بنفهم كتاب سفر الرؤية فمرات كثير ما بنشوف انه في فائدة لعالمنا الحاضر انه نقرا سفر الرؤية كشيء اللي له فائدة بعالمنا الحاضر ما بنهتم فيه مثل ما بنهتم بباقي كتب الأسفار الكتاب المقدس ما بنعتبره يمكن كمصدر مهم لحياتنا اليومية بنفكر انه اللي بيدرسه هو الشخص اللي بهمه علم الاسكاتولوجيا، علم الايام الاخيرة، هذا هو هم سفر الرؤيا. الموضوع اليوم رح يتناول هالنقاش هيدا. أه رح يحاضر بهذا الموضوع دكتور ديفيد دي سيلفا معالجا المفاهيم الخاطئة الشائعة حول سفر الرؤيا منطلقا من نوع السفر الادبي كعمل من اعمال النقد السياسي والاقتصادي والايديولوجي. سيقدم دي سيلفا مقاربة بديلة لقراءة سفر الرؤية وسيناقش انخراط يوحنا في نقد القوى والسلطات المعاصرة أنذاك مقدما لنا نموذجا للانخراط على غراره في التحليل والمقاومة في سياقنا اليوم. فرح يحاضر بالأول دكتور دي سيلفا وبعدين رح يقوم بالرد عليه اثنين من الأشخاص اللي محليين هن دكتور جوني عواد ودكتور حكمة قشوع. رح اعرف عن كل متكلم قبل ما يبلش يتكلم. سو رح نبلش مع دكتور دي سيلفا. ديفيد هو استاذ محاضر بعلم العهد الجديد واللغه اليونانيه بكليه اشلاند اللاهوتيه بولايه اوهايو بالولايات المتحده الامريكيه. وديفيد كاتب اكثر من 20 كتاب، اكثر من 20 مجلد، كتب اللي هن مراجع لاهوتيه مهمه. اذا بتحبوا بعدين تسالوه قديش عمره وامتين لحق يكتب هيدي الكتب فيكم تسالوه بعدين. واحد من الكتب اللي كاتبها ديفيد هو هيدا اللي اسمه Unholy Allegiances Heeding Revelations Warning معناته بالعربي لولاءات غير المقدسة سماع تحذيرات سفر الرؤية والموضوع ومحاضرته اليوم موجودة بعمق أكثر بهذا الكتاب هيدا واحد من كتبه صغير كثير نحن ترجمنا مؤخرا كتابه مقدمة العهد الجديد اللي طلع معنا جزئين على كبره فنحن نشرنا واطلقنا واحد من ترجماته نهار التنين الماضي اللي هو مقدمه للعهد الجديد هو كتاب مهم جدا لدارسي العهد الجديد الجديين بدراسه العهد الجديد. ديفيد اكمل دراسته العليا بكليه برينستون وبعدين حاز على الدكتوراه من جامعه امروي وهو شيخ مرسوم في الكنيسه الميثوديه في الولايات المتحده. ديفيد متزوج وعنده ثلاث اولاد وهلا حاليا بيسكن بولايه فلوريدا. فأهلا وسهلا بديفيد ديفيد ويلكم وير سو جلاد تو هاف يو اند ذا فلور از يورز ثانك يو سو ماتش فور ذات كايند انتروداكشن اند ثانك يو فور هافينغ مي هير اي هاف كاونتد ا جريت بريفليج تو بي انفولفد وذ اي بي تي اس فور ذس لاست ويك اند تو انجوي ذا هوسبيتاليتي اوف ذا فاكولتي اند ذا ستودنتس هو بين فيري فيري ويلكمينغ فور ويتش اي ام جريتفول Louder? Louder. Can you hear me now? All right. All right. Okay. So who is the Antichrist? And when will he appear? What world power will emerge as Babylon the Great? What will happen to the rest of wretched humanity in seven years after you and I are raptured? These are the questions that dominate popular interpretation of revelation in my country. And I fear that this approach to revelation has been one of our major religious exports as well. I want to propose this evening that such questions represent a major distortion of John's pastoral intent as he composed revelation and a major distraction from what God would have revelation continue to nurture among God's churches throughout the world today. The writing and communicating of Revelation was an act of political, economic, and ideological critique. John exposed the underside 
of the system that had extended its tendrils throughout the seven cities in which his congregations lived, and he urged his congregations to untangle themselves as fully as possible from the sins of that system, so as to live out faithfully and fully their obedience to the one God, and thereby their witness to his Messiah and to the values and practices enjoined by God. I base this claim uh, first on the three cues that John himself gives for reading and understanding his work. Cues that many modern readers have ignored in favor of what I would identify as three principal myths or misconceptions undergirding popular interpretation. John begins, a revelation of Jesus Christ which God gave him to show his slaves what must soon come to pass. Privileged is the one who is reading out loud and those who are listening to the words of this prophecy and who are keeping the things written in it for the time is near. John, to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace to you and peace. The first misconception about revelation or myth under which many readers of Revelation labor, is that Revelation is about us. John uses the standard letter formula, a sender to addressees, greetings, to indicate that he is writing to someone else, to the seven churches in the cities of Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. These are groups of flesh and blood Christians living in the Roman province of Asia Minor, westernmost Turkey, in the second half of the first century AD. And it is primarily about them that John is concerned. John intended his admittedly strange letter to be understood by them, to shape their perceptions of their everyday realities and motivate a particular response to their circumstances. We would do well then to approach Revelation first as we would approach Galatians or Philippians, as a message that was written with the concerns of a particular and ancient Christian community in mind. Immersing ourselves in their context will help us to hear Revelation as they did, and help us to see more clearly how John was trying to challenge them and reposition them for a more faithful response to God than their context made room for. This, in turn, helps us to hear Revelation's challenge to us in our context more reliably. The second misconception is that Revelation is about our future. John presents his material as, quote, the words of this prophecy, a term that we tend to equate with predictions looking off to the distant future. But as we read through the whole body of prophetic literature in the Old Testament, we find that while biblical prophecy can include a predictive element, it is far more hev heavily weighted toward declaring God's action in the present or announcing God's evaluation of the present practices and attitudes of God's people or of the powers that rule over God's people. Prophecy is essentially a word from the Lord breaking into the situation of God's people when they need guidance or encouragement or a call to repentance and recommitment. Prophecy was also a regular experience in the worship life of the Pauline churches and appears to have been primarily aimed at edification, encouraging, building up the churches, not prediction, as we glean from 1 Corinthians 14. In Revelation, the seven oracles to the seven churches, Revelation chapters 2 and 4, are a prime example of early Christian prophecy. The risen and glorified Lord speaks a word to the churches through the prophet John, affirming their strengths, diagnosing their weaknesses, calling them to faithful action, threatening judgment upon the recalcitrant, and promising favor for the penitent and faithful. Where a prophet does speak of the future in the overall biblical witness, he or she usually limits the prediction to the immediately forthcoming future, not the distant future, 
as did Jonah when he declared, yet 40 days and Nineveh will be destroyed. John also claims only to speak of what must soon come to pass. And Jonah shows us quite clearly that the primary purpose of prophecy is not to make hard and fast predictions about an unchangeable future, but to evoke faithful response in the present. In response to Jonah's message, the city's inhabitants repented and turned to God, with the result that God spared the city. The prediction was not fulfilled to Jonah's disappointment, but God's purposes for the prophetic word were fulfilled. Like Jonah's word, revelation as prophecy seeks mainly to stimulate faithful response among John's audience, not to provide an absolute blueprint for an uncertain future. The third misconception or myth is that revelation is written in a mysterious code commonly combined with the presumption on the part of prophecy experts that they are now in a better position to unlock this code today than the generations that have come before, even than the people in the seven churches about whom John actually cared. John opens his message by calling it a revelation. The Greek word here, apocalypsis, means unveiling, not cryptic encoding. Revelation was not sent to those seven churches as a mysterious text needing to be interpreted. It was sent to interpret the world of those first hearers. To put this another way, Revelation, uh, rather, John's churches did not need a special key to unlock Revelation. Revelation was the key by means of which they could unlock the real meaning of what was going on around them and so respond to it faithfully. Revelation lifted the veil from prominent features and prominent persons in the audience's landscape so that those Christians could see things in their world as they really were in light of the bigger picture of God's purposes for their world and in light of the larger picture of the great revolt against God which God would ultimately crush. John thus sought to help his churches identify the real challenges facing them in their situation, orienting them to respond to those challenges in a manner consonant with that bigger picture, the worldview of the early church. Revelation spreads before the eyes of Christians in Asia Minor, that larger canopy of space and time that puts their mundane reality, along with its challenges and its options, in its true light and proper perspective. Their world will look different when seen in the light of the endless worship that surrounds God's throne, the reality and ferocity of God's judgments upon idolaters, and the rewards of faithfulness. And the audience's interests in and responses to their world will be changed as a result. While revelation may appear then to lift the veil from future events, Revelation's ultimate goal is to lift the veil from contemporary actors, events, and options. In this regard, Revelation resembles several other Jewish texts from the period. For example, 1st Enoch, 4th Ezra, 2nd Baruch, the Apocalypse of Abraham, all of which uh, share certain features and rhetorical strategies in common. We are in a far less privileged position than the first audiences when it comes to reading Revelation, since the realities with which Revelation interacts, the features of a landscape very familiar to its first audience, are for us the elements of a quite distant and foreign landscape. If we lived in first century Ephesus or Pergamum, we would not have to wonder what John could be referring to by the cult of a beast or a prostitute riding astride a seven-headed monster. And if a copy of Revelation fell into the hands of a Roman official of even modest intelligence, the subversive intent of John's imagery would not be difficult to grasp in the least. Honoring Revelation as a pastoral letter, as a prophetic word, and as an apocalypse means reading it as if John's congregations really mattered. The starting point for reading Revelation in the 21st century 
is to understand its import and impact in the first century, and thus to approach it first with questions like these. What would Christians living in the seven churches, sorry, in the seven cities in the Roman province of Asia Minor in the second half of the first century have made of Revelation? What realities would they understand John to be interpreting, preeminently in light of the Jewish scriptures and the Jesus traditions that pervade Revelation? How is John challenging them to respond in light of this God's eye view of their everyday realities? What we discern the Spirit speaking to those churches becomes our way in to discerning what questions the Spirit would have us ask of our political and economic settings today, and how the Spirit would lead our churches to discern the path of witness to Jesus Christ and obedience to God's commands. Let's think here for now just about Revelation 17.1 through 19.4, the vision of the infamous prostitute Babylon and her fate. We read in Revelation 17, 1 and following, 3 and following, I saw a woman seated on a scarlet beast that was covered with blasphemous names. It had seven heads and ten horns. The woman wore purple and scarlet clothing, and she glittered with gold and jewels and pearls. In her hand, she held a gold cup full of the vile and impure things that came from her activity as a prostitute. A name, a mystery, was written on her forehead. Babylon the Great, the mother of prostitutes and the vile things of the earth. I saw that the woman was drunk on the blood of the saints and the blood of Jesus' witnesses. I was completely stunned when I saw her. The angel that's guiding John through this vision then explains, why are you so impressed? I will tell you the mystery of the woman and the beast carrying her, the one with the seven heads and ten horns. The seven heads are seven hills upon which the woman sits. The woman whom you saw is the great city that holds sway over the kings of the earth. At this point, the question for John's hearers would not be, who is this mysterious prostitute? But why is John presenting Roma in this ungodly guise? Why would John's congregations immediately connect the prostitute with Rome? First, the description of the prostitutes and the beasts' universal authority corresponded exactly to public discourse about Rome's empire. In Virgil's Aeneid, the court epic, of the age of Augustus, Zeus promises Aeneas that the Romans would rule the sea and all the lands about it. Rome's destiny would be to bring the whole world under law's dominion, to pacify, to impose the rule of law, to spare the conquered, to battle down the proud. Minucius Felix, a second century Christian, would write that Rome's power and authority had occupied the circuit of the whole world. Both authors, both Virgil and Minucius Felix, refer here to the conceptual map of the Orbis Terrarum, Latin for the circle of the lands about the Mediterranean Sea that was considered the civilized world, the world that counted, the world that Rome dominated. The map developed under the direction of Marcus Agrippa, Augustus's right-hand man during his war against Antony and during his consolidation of power, illustrates this concept. Plutarch, a near contemporary of John, celebrated the rise of Rome uniting the Mediterranean region and beyond. He writes, Rome developed and grew strong and attached to herself not only nations and peoples, but foreign kingdoms beyond the sea. And then at last, the world found stability and security when the controlling power entered into a single unwavering cycle and world order of peace. Rome was thus indeed seen as the great city that rules over the kings of the earth. Residents of the empire were aware that other nations existed that were not under Roman domination, at least not yet. Nevertheless, Authority over the kings of the earth and over the whole world was regularly attributed to Rome during this period. Second, as if to remove any doubt, 
John's mention of the seven hills on which the great city sits corresponds to a well-known and publicized feature of Rome. The seven hills of Rome were, of course, celebrated in literature and on coinage, as on the reverse of this sesterce, minted by Vespasian around 73 AD. You can see Roma in a, <clears throat> in a toga reclining against seven hills with the river god Tiber at her feet, just like the river Tiber runs through the city. And very small down at the bottom of the hills, uh, the she-wolf suckling Romulus and Remus, recalling the, uh, the mythic foundations of Rome. This coin shows us how Rome was typically represented in the province addressed by John, namely as a goddess, a divine entity, Roma, the personification, indeed the deification of the order, the rule of law, the peace and stability that Rome's imperial rule brought. Another sesterce, this one from the reign of Nero, shows another representation of Roma, this time in the military dress of a conquering goddess. Uh, if you look closely, you can see that she's wearing a helmet, sitting on a pile of armor, and in her extended right hand is a small figure known as Nike or Victoria, Victory, the goddess, the little goddess, Victory, uh, facing Roma and extending a laurel wreath to crown Roma for her conquests. <coughs> Excuse me. The goddess Roma is even more prominently visible throughout the seven cities in cult statues, indeed, throughout the whole Mediterranean, especially the Eastern Mediterranean. Um, this uh, representation of Rome could be seen in many temples of the cities addressed by John, all of which had either temples or shrines dedicated to the cult of the Roman emperor and to the goddess Roma. Pergamum had completed such a temple to Augustus and Dea Roma by 19 BC, giving that city the honor throughout the first century uh, of being temple warden, Neokoros of the imperial cult. This was an honor, incidentally, that Ephesus craved, but would only win finally in 90 AD with its temple to Domitian, despite the dedication it also showed to the emperors with its own temple to the divine Julius and the goddess Roma in its downtown. In this coin, you can see the uh, kind of stylized facade of the temple of Rome and, August, uh, Rome and Augustus in Pergamum, with the emperor uh, uh, standing in military garb, and this time the goddess Roma, standing behind the emperor, extending a wreath of victory uh, over his head. John's communication of the image of the great prostitute Babylon, therefore, is a shocking act of ideological vandalism challenging the public and official presentation of Rome's character and impact on the known world, and challenging all Christians to withdraw from any show of support for or any kind of partnership with her systems of domination. John has allowed uh, uh, God to open John's eyes wide to Rome's practices of domination and to examine these practices, political, economic, and ideological, thoroughly in the light of God's prior revelations in Scripture, especially in the Hebrew prophets, who had long ago spoken against the self-serving practices of empire as contrary to God's goodwill for human beings in every nation. Revelation 18, as a whole, draws upon texts from the Old Testament prophets pronouncing judgment on earlier self-serving, elite-serving empires. For example, Ezekiel 26 to 28 against Tyre, Jeremiah 51 and Isaiah 47 against the historical <coughs> Babylon. And so John announces boldly how Rome fares in the balance of God's judgment. He indicts Rome and its empire-wide partners First of all, for violence. Violence in the forging and maintaining of empire, including violence against dissenters, especially against Jews and Christians, represented most dramatically in the cry of the martyrs beneath the altar. He indicts Rome for economic exploitation, nurturing a system that caters to the luxury of the powerful at the expense of the many. 
that provides for the sustenance of the capital at the cost of exposing the provinces to want, that brings prosperity only to those who are in bed with her and advance her imperial agendas and interests, and that is built and sustained ultimately on the backs of the slaves that are part of the cargoes taken from across the known world to the heart of empire. And third, John indicts Rome for idolatrous presumption in Rome's claims on its own behalf in its attempts to legitimate its power over the world, seen, for example, in the worship of Roma as a goddess and in the myth of Roma Eterna, eternal Rome, showing Rome's lack of humility in the face of all the lessons of history and any lack, a lack of any sense of accountability to the one God, his justice, or his vision for human society. Every seat of empire, no matter how prosperous at its peak, will one day sit as a ruin, and Rome will be no different. The eternal city stands under God's imminent judgment, sentenced already to destruction for her crimes against apostles, saints, and prophets, and will surely go up in smoke and be laid desolate rather than live up to its name. The scene of the great prostitute, stripped, naked, devoured by her allies, and burned up, is John's final answer to the empire's projection of itself in the image of the divine goddess, worshipped throughout the subjugated provinces, thus leaving Roma Eterna fully exposed in the light of scripture and in the light of the God proclaimed by the scriptures. The wealth to be enjoyed by participating in the larger global economy was, as far as John was concerned, a dangerous lure toward sharing in the violence and political injustice that undergirded such an economy. It was a lure toward sharing in the economic injustice that allowed the resources and produce of the provinces to be siphoned off to satisfy the immoderate cravings of Rome's inhabitants and its worldwide elite partners. John understood long before the modern era that a person cannot share in the profits of domination without also sharing in responsibility for its crimes. And so his summons rings out, come out of her, my people, so that you don't take part in her sins and don't receive any of her plagues. An important metaphor for John is seduction. Rome has convinced people from every language and ethnic group that they want what Rome offers that Rome's claims about itself and about the benefits that getting in bed with Rome will bring are true and reliable, that giving Rome what she wants by way of service, resources, and allegiance benefits all parties concerned in the end. Rome knew, as all clever dominations know, that the more that people could be made to be addicted to comfort, to pleasurable experiences, and to gratification, the less likely they are to oppose and challenge the system that provides these things. John wants his congregations to become much more attentive to how Rome has gotten under their skin, has made them buy into Rome's lies and participate in, if only by benefiting from, Rome's crimes for the sake of enjoying what Rome has to offer. Not all of John's congregations understood partnership with Rome to be a spiritual and moral problem. John characterized the Christians in Laodicea thus, you say, I am rich, I have prospered, I have need of nothing, and you don't know that you are wretched and pitiable and poor and blind and naked. John seeks to shake these Christians out of their self-centered mindset that says, as long as I'm happy and getting what I want, there's no problem. Within the congregation in Thyatira, Christian teachers were trying to help the disciples find a way to have the best of both worlds when Jesus testifies that it's simply impossible to serve both God and mammon. John writes Revelation to help break the spell of Rome's propaganda, power, and opulence so as to shake the Christians loose and set them free to pursue God's vision for them rather than Rome's vision for them. He calls for a lifestyle of critique and resistance in the midst of the crimes of empire. He challenges Christians in the strongest terms not to participate in the imperial cult and the cult of Roma, whatever the costs, as both witness against 
and witness too. He calls them to value economic marginalization over tainted wealth as both witness against and witness to. It is important to understand that coming out is not just a witness against Rome's practices of domination and Rome's masking of its crimes under its propaganda. It's also a witness to the values that God would have infuse human community and its structures. Valuing the practices that nurture healing and restoration of God's creation by all, that bring an end to the violence that perpetuates mourning, pain, and death. It'll be obvious by now that I would encourage us to resist the approach to Revelation that seeks to use it to label some contemporary or soon-to-emerge person, country, or group as the beast or the whore of Babylon. The challenge of Revelation is not to play pin the tail on the Antichrist, if that's a game here, but to go and do likewise as John has done. John's precedent in Revelation summons us to ask, how do our country's economic practices, political entanglements, and ideologies look when measured up against the proclamation of the Hebrew prophets, Jesus' teachings and example, and John's critique of his own imperial context? What systemic values have we, as individual disciples and as collectives of disciples, churches, <coughs> internalized, and in what directions are we pulled that run counter to the call of God to holiness and justice, to allegiance to the global family of faith, to setting the kingdom of God first? In what ways have we been seduced into cooperating with and even working to maintain systems of domination in our world that hinder rather than advance God's vision for all people? This calls for careful study, both of the scriptures, the frame of reference from which the examination takes place, and the real-life practices of our contexts and their effects on human beings within and outside our systems. John would have us use his work alongside the rest of scripture to discern how God would call us to come out of the ungodly or self-serving ruts and habits and practices that our society has made us think to be normal, even good and advantageous, and signs of blessing. How God would call us to come out of those webs so that God could remake us as disciples and as communities of faith who will serve God's ends for all humanity. These are the kinds of questions John forces upon us uh, who would keep the words of this prophecy and not the idle questions about who and what and when. Too many people who are absorbed by those kinds of questions go on being and living just as Babylon has shaped them. Thank you for your kind attention this evening. Thank you, David. <clears throat> وهلا رح يعقب على دكتور دي سيلفا دكتور جوني عواد دكتور جوني هو استاذ محاضر في علم العهد الجديد في كليه اللاهوت للشرق الادنى هو حائز على شهاده دكتوراه من كليه برينستون اللاهوتيه وهو شيخ مرسوم في الكنيسه المشيخيه في لبنان اهلا وسهلا فيك دكتور جوني جود ايفنينغ ليديز اند جنتلمان My first literary encounter, Liqa al-Adabi, my first literary encounter with Professor De Silva took place about 10 years ago when I read sections of his commentary on the book of Hebrews. A second literary encounter happened most recently when I had the opportunity to read his book on Revelation, Seeing Things John's Way, published in 2009. <coughs> And though I admit that my understanding of Revelation has for years been shaped by Elizabeth Schussler Fiorenza's book on Revelation, I also admit that I'm fascinated by the new insights brought about by Professor De Silva's rhetorical approach to the book of Revelation, his clarity of thought, style of writing, and most importantly, 
his concern for contextualizing, for translating the message of revelation for the Christian church in the 21st century. This concern for contextualization, which not many scholars are capable of doing, is flushed out so nicely in the final chapter of his book on Revelation under the title, John's Vision Beyond the Roman World, What Might the Spirit Continue to Say to the Churches? Perhaps, perhaps I am beginning to shift gears from Fiorenza to De Silva. <laughs> At any rate, those literary encounters of seeing in a mirror dimly are over now. Now we meet face to face, and what a great pleasure and honor to respond to your lecture, Professor De Silva. And thank you, ABTS, for holding this event and for the invitation you extended to me to participate in it. I am in full agreement with Professor De Silva's primary concern in this lecture, namely, to liberate the interpretation of the Book of Revelation from an interpretive tradition, I like to call it a Babylonian captivity, an interpretive tradition prominent in some Protestant <coughs> circles and especially among premillennial dispensationalists, whose belief in a Bible that is verbally inspired, that must be consistently interpreted literally, and who situate themselves in the time preceding the 1,000 years reign of Christ of which the book of Revelation talks about, all of these have turned the book of Revelation to a book of predictions about events taking place in the present and a road map for future events in world history leading up in twisted scenarios <coughs> to the destruction of our physical world. What is more dangerous is that these distorted views on the book of Revelation have been translated into political action in the corridors and hallways where U.S. foreign policy is made. We Middle Easterners know very well the tremendous negative impact that this interpretive tradition has had on our regional conflicts, mainly the Arab-Israeli conflict. We also know the threat it poses to the lives of millions of people in this region, as well as, the region, as, as well as regional and international peace. For those interested in pursuing this matter, I recommend to you reading Stephen Sizer's book, which has been translated into Arabic on Christian Zionism on the road to Armageddon, at tariq ila Armageddon. Instead, Professor De Silva insists on honoring the character of Revelation and John's original purposes in writing for his seven congregations. And for this purpose, he lays out his methodological and hermeneutical presuppositions over against, using as a foil, what he calls the three myths that have dominated the popular interpretive tradition of Revelation. He tears down these myths Using, using the opening verses of the book of Revelation. Now, tearing down myth one, that Revelation is about us, that's the myth, he tears it down. By tearing it down, he teaches us to respect not only the distance between us and the original readers, but also the situational particularity of Revelation, and for that matter, of all biblical writings. <laughs> biblical Author, biblical writings are vehicles of communication meant to address particular communities living at particular times under particular circumstances. The task of the interpreter is first and foremost to respect and understand the original purposes of biblical writers as they address their original hearers. When tearing down myth, myth two, Revelation is about our future, it becomes apparent that the true meaning of biblical prophecy, and this applies to Revelation too, is an act of interpreting the present of the original readers in order to evoke faithful response from them and not predictions of the future. Tearing down myth three, that Revelation is written in a mysterious code, 
helps us to understand Revelation as a text that reveals, that interprets, that unveils the reality of the original readers and not a mysterious codification of contemporary or futuristic events to be decoded by modern interpreters. When read on the ruins and the debris of these three myths, argues Professor De Silva, revelation will be seen primarily as an act of political, economic, and ideological critique of the Roman Empire in the second half of the first century with a powerful message for the church in the 21st century. Tearing down these myths is something that I fully agree with. However, the opening verses of Revelation make also an imminent eschatological claim. What must soon take place for the time is near. This eschatological claim is about the imminent victory of God over all power structures of evil in the world. Professor De Silva, how does your, quote, political reading of Revelation, end of quote, account for this imminent eschatological claim? How do we reinterpret for our own times this eschatological claim, not only in Revelation, but also in the rest of the New Testament, particularly after the wheel of history has turned 2,000 years. At the beginning of the lecture, Professor De Silva states the following. The writing and communicating of Revelation was an <coughs> act of political, economic, and ideological critique. I agree. But why did you entitle the lecture a political reading of Revelation as if to suggest that the political critique is the lens with which John sees and wants, to, wants us to interpret the economic, the realities and ideological challenge of his congregations? Isn't it truer to John's purposes to say that Revelation is first and foremost an ideological, theological critique that leads to and spills into a political and economic critique? After all, the world belongs to God. Worship is due to God, and God is the one who rules and controls history, and not Rome. In other words, had Rome not imposed the cult of the goddess Roma and imperial cult so as to threaten his congregation's faithfulness to God, would John have ever made the same political and economic critique? What objections do you have if your lecture was entitled an ideological, theological reading of Revelation? I know that the categories politics, economics, ideology are interrelated in the book of Revelation, but my question is one of focus. In the second part of the lecture, Professor De Silva puts his methodology to action. Through a straightforward historical interpretation of Revelation 17.1 to 19.4 that draws on contemporaneous and later non-canonical sources, coinage, and archaeology, Professor, Professor De Silva unmasks the image of the great prostitute Babylon. Babylon, the prostitute, is the Roman Empire who stands under God's judgment for the violence it committed, the economic policies of exploitation it undertook, and the idolatrous presumptions it practiced. The only thing I wish to say about this section is the following. This is how revelation should be interpreted. <laughs> Nevertheless, interpreting revelation as an act of critique against the empire is a position that I fully agree with. But this raises a New Testament question about church and state relations. How does one reconcile this act of critique in Revelation with Paul's ethic of subordination in Romans 13 to the same political authority that Revelation critiques, which is an ethics 
that has paralyzed the church in Germany from making a critique of Hitler's <coughs> Nazism in World War II. In the third part of the lecture, Professor De Silva explores John's pastoral concern and the perennial challenge. John's pastoral mes message for the, church, for the Christians of the seven churches is clear. Come out of her. This is where the culture of critique and resistance begins to develop. Boycott the seduction of prosperity provided by Rome's cruel economic system, simply because this whole system is based on violence, exploitation, social and political injustices. Do not share in her vision, witness against, but share and but seek God's vision, witness to, whatever the cost may be. But what does coming out of her mean? Is this simply an invitation for withdrawal and resignation from the public sphere that Rome controls and manipulates? Or is it a call for actively engaging, combating, confronting the empire in the very public sphere, in that very same public sphere? And if so, how? <clears throat> Answering this question clearly has tremendous implications on the character of the church's ministry in today's world. On the perennial challenge of revelation, allow me, Professor De Silva, to bring this perennial challenge closer to home. If we were to think of John addressing Iraqi Christians today, what would his message be? They are facing an empire that has exercised excessive violence against them and against other minorities, and many, 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 many of them have joined the martyrs crying beneath the altar. They have been exploited economically, not through, this, not through seduction, but through the loss of their homes and property and businesses, and have been exposed to want. They live as wandering aliens in their own land and strangers in neighboring countries. Their worship of God has been humiliated and scratched by an empire that has divinized itself and desecrated the holiest symbols of their faith. How would John address their witness to their God and help them in their witness against this empire? What should they do? How are they to come out of her? Are they to shake the dust of their feet against this empire and leave their land as Jesus taught his disciples when rejected? Should they defend themselves by whatever means? Or should they emulate their master by carrying their cross as a witness to him and a witness against their empire all the way to the end, regardless what the cause and the consequences may be, even if that leads to their martyrdom? And is their martyrdom as meaningful as, the, as that of their master? Or there is a difference between Christ's meaningful and redemptive suffering and death and the seemingly meaningless suffering and death that his people experience in the world? How can faithfulness to God in the face of the empire of the beast be lived by Iraqi Christians today? Palestinian Christians tomorrow, Syrians Jordanian and Egyptian Christians the day after, and maybe Lebanese Christians in the days after tomorrow. Professor De Silva, these are existential questions to us in this region. Please help us reflect on them. Let me conclude by saying, <clears throat> Professor De Silva has set for us a road map, not only for interpreting revelation, but also for discerning its message for the church today. I call upon ABTS to finish the task that Professor De Silva has started by holding a conference on contextualizing the message of revelation 
to our Middle Eastern context in general and our Lebanese context in particular in order to discern why, where, when, how, and whether we should come out of her. Thank you very much. David will give you ample time at the end to respond to some of these questions if you wish. You don't have to. Now we're going to listen to a report from Dr. Hikmat Kassour. Hikmat is the director of the Council 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 of the Council. Hikmat wrote a number of books in a book, 700 pages. بيتناول المخطوطات العربية الأولى للأناجيل وهلأ هو بصدد كتابة سلسلة من الكتب اللي بتتناول الأناجيل كمان حكمة أكمل دراسته العليا بالأي بي تي أس وبعدين كفى بالأي بي تي أس إنترناشنال بابتش تيروجيكال سامينيري ببراغ وبعدين حاز على الدكتوراه من جامعة برمنغهام ببريطانيا وهو قس مرسوم في الكنيسة المعمدانية في لبنان حكمة متأهل وعنده ثلاثة أولاد ساكن هون بالمصرية وطلبنا من حكمة أنه يقدم موضوعه بالعربي لفائدة الحضور العربي بيناتنا فتفضل حكمة تقسم مقالة دي سيلفا ثلاثة أقسام رئيسية أتناول كل قسم على حدة وألخص الفكرة البارزة فيه ومن ثم أنبر على بعض الجوانب التي أراها مهمة في سياقنا الشرق أوسطي يحاول المحاضر في القسم الأول استبعاد أي مقاربة مستقبلية لدراسة سفر الرؤية ويشدد على البعد الرعوي للرسالة وأهمية تحفيز مؤمني الكنائس السبع في الشرق الأدنى على السلوك في القداسة وطاعة والطاعة للإله الواحد بعيدا من الانصياع إلى الخطيئة التي يقدمها النظام السائد ونحن نوافق على هذه المقاربة ونعبر ونعتبر أن الفرع الأكثر انتشارا في شرقنا والمسمى بالمستقبل التدبيري Dispensational Futurism والذي يفسر أحداث سفر الرؤية حرفيا ويرى تعاقب الرؤى بأنها تشير إلى أحداث تاريخية محددة ستحدث في المستقبل يطعن بالنوع الأدبي لهذه الرسالة ويخفق في تقديم المعنى الذي قصده الكاتب لقرائه الأولين ولكن التركيز الرعوي دون الالتفات إلى الوراء والنظر إلى المستقبل يقلل من قيمة هذا السفر سفر الرؤية هو رسالة ونبوة ونوعه الأدبي أيضا أبوكاليبتيك هي رسالة تكلمنا الآن وتشجعنا وتوجهنا ونبوة تنطق بكلمة الله وتحضر لنا النظرة السماوية للأحداث الأرضية وترينا كيف يرى الله نفسه تعاقب الأحداث الماضية والحاضرة والمستقبلة للبشرية والكنيسة فقراءة التاريخ وأقصد أحداث العهد القديم سفر الخروج وغيره في ضوء حدث موت المسيح وقيامته ينبئ عن مستقبل مليء بالرجاء تحت سيطرة الخروف المطلقة والبعد الذي يسمى أبوكاليبتيك في السفر وهو نوع أدبي انتشر في القرون الأولى غايته أعلان أحداث مستقبلية وفي هذا السياق ولكنه ولكنها محددة هي مجيء المسيح لينقذ شعبه إدانة الأشرار وبسط ملكوت الله في العالم الجديد فالرجاء المستقبلي مهم وأساسي في هذه الرسالة الرعوية القسم الثاني يحاول الدكتور دي سيلفا في القسم الثاني أن يشدد على نظرة الله للإمبراطورية وينجح في هذه المهمة يبين أن الأحداث في رؤية 17 واحد إلى 19 أربعة تشير إلى الأمبراطورية الزانية ومصيرها وأن مستمعي يوحنا كما قال المحاضر وهو على حق لم يتساءلوا عن هوية هذه الزانية فقد عرفوها إنها روما 
أما سؤالنا اليوم في هذا القرن وهذا الشرق وبعد زوال الإمبراطورية الرومانية من لبس لباسها وتقلد قيمها ومن يشبهها في هذا العصر وما هي المعايير التفسيرية الدقيقة والإشارات الواضحة التي تدلنا على أنظمة مشابهة للإمبراطورية الرومانية يفضحها نص الكتاب هل هي أمريكا أم إيران؟ هل هي الإسلام أم الكثلكة؟ هل هي البروتستانتية المتحررة أم الأصولية الناموسية؟ هل هي فريق 14 أم 8 أدار؟ أو لا هذا ولا ذاك؟ هل هي الصهيونية اليهودية أم الحركة الداعشية؟ فأنا لا أتكلم على أن الرؤية رؤية يوحنا تتنبأ عن نظام سياسي معين أو دولة محددة أو مجموعة دول أو ديانة معينة كلا إن النبوة تشير إلى الأمبراطورية الرومانية أما من الناحية التطبيقية فهي تدين كل نظام ودولة وأمبراطورية على مر العصور لها نفس أيديولوجية الأمبراطورية الرومانية السابقة وسياستها فمن يحدد اليوم روما المعاصرة؟ في القسم الثالث من المقالة يركز الكاتب على الاهتمام الرعوي والتحدي المستمر هنا ينطلق من بيئته ويخاطب مجتمعه في الغرب بشكل خاص ويشدد على مسائل مرتبطة بالغنى والاقتصاد وغيرها مع إقحام موضوع الشهادة والاستشهاد بشكل مقتضب أما البعد الرعوي الشرق أوسطي ينطلق من الشهادة والاستعداد للاستشهاد كالسلوك الوحيد المقبول بلغة سفر الرؤية للغلبة على كل نظام يقوم ضد المسيح فكل من يعيش تحت الاضطهاد والظلم يتوق إلى الحرية والغلبة على الأعداء الظالمين وعبارة الغلبة تدوي في كل صفحات سفر الرؤية فنقرأ في الفصل 3 اللي هي 21 من يغلب فسأعطيه أن يجلس معي في عرشي كما غلبت أنا أيضا وجلست مع أبي في عرشه فاهتمام يوحنا الرعوي هو تذكير الكنيسة بطريقة الله في الغلبة وبالتالي طريقتنا نحن تلاميذه فإذا راجعنا الفصل الخامس من سفر الرؤيا نلاحظ أن نظرة اليهودية معبر عنها بقول الشيوخ لا تبكي هو ذا غلب الأسد الذي من صبط يهوذا أصل داود ليفتح السفر ويفك ختومه السبع فأمامنا مشهد حرب مشيحانية سياسية وتوقعات يهودية بغلبة عسكرية على الأعداء أما الآية التي تليها مباشرة الآية ستة بعدما سمع عن أسد رأى خروفا قائما كأنه مذبوح وبعدها نشيد يصرخ قائلا مستحق أنت أن تأخذ السفر وتفتح ختومه لأنك ذبحت واشتريتنا لله بدمك من كل قبيلة ولسان وشعب وأمة فالغلبة تحققت ولكن من خلال الخروف المذبوح من خلال الجالس على فرس لكنه أبيض ومن خلال المتسربل بثوب مغموس بدم أي بدمه هو وليس بدم الآخرين ويدعى اسمه كلمة الله وليس سيف الله يضرب الأمم بسيف ولكنه خارج من فمه فالبعد الرعوي اليوم لكنيسة مغلوبة في الظاهر يشدد على أن الغلبة تمت بواسطة الخروف المذبوح وأن خلاصنا اليوم من الظلم يتحقق في نظام العالم الجديد إن تشبهنا أولا بمسيحنا وعشنا شهادتنا بكل أمانة والتي لا تخلو أحيانا من الاستشهاد فكما غلب المسيح هكذا أتباعه فيقول الوحي عنهم وهم غلبوه بدم الخروف وبكلمة شهادتهم 
ولم يحبوا حياتهم حتى الموت فمن يتعمق بسفر الرؤيا من جهة ومن جهة أخرى يلاحظ ما يحدث من حولنا اليوم من استشهاد أبطال الإيمان يعلم يقينا أن ملكوت الله والخروف قد أشرك أشرق أخيرا على بلادنا العربية وأن المسيح يغلب بالمحبة والسلام قلوب إخوتنا العرب في شرقنا العزيز وأختم بما قال أحمد شوقي في موضوع الغلبة يا فاتح القدس خلي السيف ناحية ليس الصليب حديدا كان بل خشبا إذا نظرت إلى أين إلى أين انتهت يده وكيف جاوز بسلطانه القطب علمت أن وراء الضعف مقدرة وأن للحق لا للقوة الغلبة شكرا Thank you, Dr. Hikmat. Uh, Dr. De Silva, before we open it up for questions from the audience, would you like to respond or answer some of the questions? The floor is yours. Thank you. First, I want to thank both Dr. Johnny and Dr. Hikmat for taking the time to do this. I, I know that that's you have many, many other things to do, and I'm honored that you took the time. It's more important than what we do. I don't think so. I don't think so. Um, and I'm very appreciative of, of, of your responses. Um, and as for the, the questions that you raised, um, I think it's difficult to answer this, this part. The first question that you raised very much, what do we do with the time is near. It's very difficult. And, and why does John, I think maybe uh, almost a dozen times, say, you know, this is going to happen quickly throughout Revelation. And it's not entirely satisfying uh, uh, yet, but, but I'm thinking of imminence as a, a, as a way of expressing priority. That is to say, John says it's happening soon, but rhetorically, that gets translated as, this is the most important thing that you need to do. It's almost like, um, like the tyranny of the urgent in my life. You know, that, that which has a closer due date gets my attention. Um, and, and so it seems, dealing with the reality of two millennia, almost, between John and, and ourselves, um, that the language of imminence is a way of saying this is, this is of the highest priority. Uh, the, the victory of God is the ultimate foundation for all decision making. Um, and, 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 and the expression of that is, is uh, expressed in the language of tomorrow. Um, you're absolutely right, we could have really called this lecture anything. I mean, just no contest. Um, you got to call it something, and it's the hardest thing to give a title to. When I preach, I never, I never give a title to my sermon. There's just two quotation marks and some empty space in between it and the bulletin. I just, I hate titles. Um, but you, you are right that that is, it is more fundamentally ideological critique. I do wonder, though. Um, I, or let me start that another way. I think John would still have written Revelation quite differently probably, but still have written it, uh, even if there were no cult of Roma or cult of the emperor. Uh, I don't think that, that his interest in violence and economics is merely um, incidental. It may be secondary, granted, but I don't think it's just incidental. I think um, uh, the, the violence of Rome, the, the economic uh, exploitation of Rome, would still have called forth some kind of critique, uh, very much like what we find in the Hebrew prophets again, but it's just a guess, really. What does coming out of her mean? For John, I think it really, I mean, his context, he's calling for active critique. He's calling for active engagement. Uh, but John is, is strange. I don't, I've said this before, I mean, I'm fascinated by Revelation, but I don't much like John. 
And I don't much like his vision of discipleship because his vision for discipleship in his context is get out there and witness to the, the ills of society and the lies of, of its propaganda until the powers that be kill you. And then, you know, on to the next Christian. Go out there <laughs> and witness until the number of the martyrs is complete. And, and it seems to me that, you know, Revelation is not written in response to mass martyrdom. Revelation is written almost in part to encourage martyrdom, to encourage the kind of witness that invites that aggressive response. Uh, this is a prophet who is, or, or a man who is saying, you know, the, the, the number of those uh, under the altar isn't full yet. Uh, it needs you <laughs> and you. <laughs> um, um, and if you live in line with John's word, with John's sense of, uh, of how evil the world system is and how complete and unyielding is God's requirement of allegiance, you are going to make uh, yourself far more uh, readily a target for the people around you. So, but that's John. Luckily, that's, you know, 19 centuries uh, removed. Do we carry that into the context like the ones you named? Well, this is where it becomes too sober. And you're absolutely right to go there. The first thing I want to say is I, I don't presume to, to know what John would say to Iraqi Christians. Iraqi Christians and, and the idea of the conference you propose is a great one, isn't it? Sure. Isn't it a great one? I mean, funding matters aside, it's a great one. <laughs> it's the sort of thing that, that Christians from this region can discern together. But um, John would probably not view the martyrdoms as defeat. He might not even view the martyrdoms as tragedy. Uh, John, you know, he's a strange man, granted. But he would probably view them as victory. Uh, people saying, my connection with God is more important than the rest of my life. Whether that's 10 years or, or 70 years, my connection with God is more important than the rest of my life. And, and these are the kinds of, of witnesses that John seems particularly to honor. They're the ones who share in the millennium. Uh, they're the ones who stand with palm leaves in their hands and white robes before the throne of God. They're the ones whose tears God wipes from their eyes. So, um, so John cared a whole lot more about allegiance to God and the world beyond than anyone in my context does. So it makes it very difficult to deal with the question of martyrdom. Hikmat, I, I really have to ask you, please, if you would, to kind of summarize any talking points you might have for me. The translator was working very well and very hard, but on the other hand, I hate to respond to what might not have been your, <laughs> your <Sure>. point. <laughs> so you want me to? Yeah, to whatever, what, you know, I'm all yours. If you have something you want. You want well, to. I tried to mention the fact that uh, there is a futuristic uh, look at the... Um, book of Revelation in terms of not specific events in the future, but in fact that Jesus is going to return, the victorious Christ, uh, there's going to be judgment and they're going to be, uh, his kingdom is going to come, mm -hmm. and there's going to be a new system, you know. So, so there is a futuristic approach to that. And then in terms of uh, the pastoral concern in the Middle East, it's more about witnessing, mm -hmm. be willing to die. Mm -hmm. And that's the way John sees victory. Mm -hmm. This is how it happened with Jesus, and this is how it's going to happen with the church. The, the kingdom will come through <coughs> the victory of the Lamb and the witness of his disciples. So I don't have any specific question in term. In that case, yeah. I have no specific yeah. answer. <laughs> answer for me. <laughs> Great. But I agree with so both your points. And, and, and I would want to affirm the first one in particular. I, I, I may, you know, rhetorically overplay my hand on that one just for, for effect. But the, the witness of the whole canon mm. is to the coming again of Christ, which is again a way of saying everything that happens on this stage 
uh, on which we, we strut and fret our hour happens under the shadow of that uh, judgment and rule. Mm. So, sure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both so much for your responses. Can I just say a word? Sure. Uh, question, uh, something? Thank you for the answers, uh, Professor De Silva. The other day I was, um, I was with my family and my brother-in-law was given a video uh, showing an Egyptian <coughs> Coptic priest speaking about the willingness to to be martyred for the sake of Christ. And as he was watching this video, he said to me, oh, take it, I don't want to see this. You cannot be faithful to Christ except through martyrdom? Mm. Professor De Silva, we live in a culture of death here. A lot of people have become allergic to it. There's so much death happening for the sake of God, and there's so much killing in the name of God. And so this whole thing about martyrdom, I think may receive some content criticism from us, at least from me, maybe. No doubt, rightly so. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> We're the children of life. Uh, so but, but if somebody is wanting to kill us, we should be ready for that. But it's not that we're seeking it, we want it to happen. Yeah. <laughs> Of course, to be killed. للاسف وقتنا هلا انتهى بس فينا نكفي الحديث عن ضيافه هلا برا ونكفي بطريقه انفورمال اكثر. بنشكر مره ثانيه كل ضيوفنا والمحاضرين عندنا واهلا وسهلا فيكم الضيافه برا. اهلا وسهلا.